You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. I'm excited. This is something fun. This is something new. This is the beginning of, dare I say it, a new era here on the Options Insider Radio Network. Welcome to the first, the inaugural Options Insider Pro Q&A session. My name, of course, Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the old network upon which so many of you are used to binging and mainlining for Oh, over 14 years now. So a lot of great content for you there in the archives. But as I mentioned, this is something new. This is the beginning, the kickoff of what we announced for the first time only a week ago. It seems like it's been a lifetime ago, but it's only been about a week since we announced the launch of Options Insider Plus and Options Insider Pro. And part of the Options Insider Pro is going to be fun, interesting, exclusive new content for our Options Insider Pro members. I'm glad to see so many of you have already jumped on and taken the plunge and joined us over there on Options Insider Pro. We love all of you out there also on the plus side. So we thought this is normally, going forward, this is going to be exclusive for those folks who have taken that plunge and embarked on this journey with us here on the Options Insider Pro side of the fence. We thought for this week only to give you guys a sense of what we're up to over here We're going to make it available to everyone here on the network. We're going to get it on the podcast. You're going to get it live right now. In fact, I see you folks piling in right now. Going forward, these live sessions are not going to be available for everyone outside of the members as well. So just something to bear in mind. If you like this, if you enjoy this kind of content, you like picking people's brains, leading experts from the world of options and derivatives, we're going to run the gamut, listeners. It's going to be exciting, all sorts of fun stuff. And, of course, if you're a member, you have a guest you like to Pick their brain. Hit us up. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you folks. We'll see if we can make it happen for you guys out there. So this week, you're going to get a double dose of, of course, our first ever pro Q&A session. That's today. And then Friday, you're going to get the first dose of the inaugural Options Oddities. Yes, the return of the program you folks have loved and asked about ever since it went on hiatus. I forgot how many years ago now. At least three. (laughs) So you guys get both of those. Don't worry if you're a pro member right now. We're adjusting you to get an extra week. So you're not paying for a week that people are getting it for free. Don't worry. (laughs) We take care of all of our people here. We want to give everyone a taste of what is cooking over here. And a lot is cooking. And we thought, you know, given how many questions you have bombarded this guest with over his appearances now on the network, we thought who better than to kick off our inaugural Q&A sessions here on the Pro Network than none other than the Oracle of New Hampshire himself, a.k.a. the keeper of that magical backtesting machine, a.k.a. the keeper of all the earnings volatility, none other than Mr. Matt Amberson, the founder over there at ORETS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services, a.k.a. the guy who danced in that ZZ Top video, (laughs) Mr. Matt Welcome to the inaugural Pro Q&A session. Are you as excited as I am, sir? I am pumped. I'm excited. I'm honored to be here. Uh, You know, this is uh, exciting. We've had such great questions. We always have trouble getting to all the questions. So uh, it's going to be great that we can interact and get to all the awesome questions uh, that your clients, pros, all the listeners that come back week after week. 
I'm, I'm excited, Mark. Let's, let's, let's go. All right. Let's do it then. You heard the man. He is ready. A lot of you have already taken advantage of the opportunity. You've already hit us up. You've sent in a bunch of questions already. So we already have a ton. <laughs> These sessions are probably going to go for about an hour or until your questions are exhausted, whichever comes first. I'm not going to keep Matt here for 10 hours, even though you probably could answer it, all of your questions here. But if you guys are listening live, if you have questions you want to chime in, hit us up. Let us know. Going forward, again, this is going to be only for the pro members. So if you're listening live, take advantage now. Get those questions at us. Matt, I know it's intimidating to be the first one here in the hot seat. So we'll ease you in. How about that? We'll make it fun to start off for you so you're not sweating over there in the land of new hampshire this first one comes from tony he just wants to know very simply how did you get in the sharp dressed man video <laughs> well this is the most intimidating question mark oh we started uh, off with so, the big one i'm sorry you know i was talking to some of our guys that weren't even that i at work at ors weren't even born when that uh sharp dress video came out so i had to explain that it was zz top and they still didn't know what i was talking about and i said these Rock and roll guitarist with long beards. It was one of the uh, top videos back then in the like, 80s, I believe. And, you know, we used to play beach volleyball, and there was uh, guys in Hollywood that were beach volleyball players that said, hey, we need some extras. You guys are, uh, you guys are a fun-loving group. Let's uh, come on out to downtown L.A., which is about, I don't know, 45 minutes away with good traffic. And uh, all night we stayed up and did uh, in a abandoned bank and you know, of course we met zz top and danced all night and you know a lot of it ended up on the cutting room floor but you know you guys your crack staff caught the picture of me on there and then you know what you you, you know your crack staff needs to get to side out the movie because i uh, have a few uh choice appearances there so that's the, the next thing mark oh right? you have a film now as well so now our listeners can can bombard you with questions you have to check out your imdb multiple appearances there yeah. for matt on the imdb so i'll have to check that out listeners so there you go i knew that one was coming i knew this next one was coming to matt this one just happens to come from ajk 886 sounds like a droid in a sci-fi movie or something they say uh, is there a right answer when I'm trading earnings, should I lean long or short option? Matt, this is kind of the perennial question. You and I have chewed over this for ages, ever since we first started really analyzing the earnings vol data over there at Orat. So you've been crunching the numbers. Dare I say it, you are the keeper of the earnings volatility data. What do you have to say for AJ and everyone else out there? Excuse me, AJK and everyone else out there who has a question like this going into earnings season. Is there a way they should lean? Well, if, if you would have asked me this, one year ago, I would have said it's probably better to lean long because it's about a, a coin flip and, you know, you don't lose as much. Um, and, you know, might as well. It was about, you know, uh, uh, what was it 40 percent win rate? And, um, you know, so but the, the there was a break even approximately for being long options. As we know, that has changed this last year. It's now brutally underwater. So I would say some type of a way out of the money, uh, and I'd just do one side. I wouldn't do both sides. Just try to get lucky on on one side. That's what that's the way I'll, I would play it. Out of the money, put spread uh, for a credit, or out of the money call spread, call spread for a credit. Uh, you, you know, some of the successful people that uh, that trade uh, um, earnings, you know, do uh, time spread, so you could figure. Uh, figure that out how the uh, we we show how the volatility would come in so you could model that out so those are the types of things i would think about uh, around earnings mark and you're right that the last year does kind of gum up the works because the last year and change since the pandemic has been just a, a bit of an aberrant period let's just put it mildly and again if you're not sure what all this is referring to go check out uh, matt and his team have put out those earnings move earnings move results and earnings season reports you can get them all over there at the optionsinsider.com, click on the options news and articles tab, and you could see all that good stuff. You can see what we're talking about, how no matter what seems to happen in a lot of these names over the course of the last year and change doesn't really result in a lot of activity and a certainly not a lot of volatility as a result. So that's been a little bit of an aberration, to say the least. All right. We probably talk earnings probably for the rest of the hour, Matt, but we've got questions here coming in hot and heavy. This one comes in from our regular listener pro member over there, my boy Luigi. He wants to know what is the best way to use skew to your advantage. 
I know to look for the IV difference with calls and puts, but not sure I understand what is meant when they say a higher implied volatility represents risk in that direction. So, Mr. Matt, sir, we have to say for Luigi wants to know, what is the best way he can use skew to his advantage? You know, this is an area you've been looking a lot at of late, sir. Yeah, so the way to think about it, uh, you know, for four options, just in general, you know, implied volatility uh, is the estimate of how much the stock is going to move. So if you uh, buy implied volatility and the stock moves a lot more and it goes outside of your range or your, your uh, hedging and, and such, that's usually a good thing. Now, skew is just the next derivative underneath that. And skew asks you to look at the distribution of returns. So, um, you know, so uh, now or there at least used to be a skew to the downside, meaning the puts were trading at a higher implied volatility than the out of the money calls. And so if that distribution did not hold, you can uh, see profit in a hedged position, you know, having uh, long calls and short puts in the hedging. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult position for, for retail to do, but that, that's one of the ways to think about it. So um, what's happened, you know, now since what, what I've called the, or many have called the Robin Hood effect is now the skew has moved from puts to about even, and, and maybe even some of the out of the money calls are even higher than the out of the money puts. Uh, this is generally not in the indexes, but in some of the single stocks, especially the meme type stocks. And so again, if you have a stock that you think will move with an equal probability to the downside as the upside, and usually what happens in a market correction, you go down in an elevator and up an escalator, meaning you go up sl more slowly than you do going down, then you know having a, a skewed position where you might be short skew where you you, you might do a uh, call spread where you buy a call sell a at more out of the money call uh, that type of position may work better than uh, other positions given uh, that increased call skew that we're seeing and may, maybe not a commensurate change in the distribution to that side. And that's definitely what we're seeing in some of these uh, stocks. The, the way, way out of the money calls are uh, just trading at astronomic volatilities. Uh, you know, you, uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, I think, about the uh, selling the uh, way, way out of the money calls. But, but uh, suffice to say that, that, that there are many options out there that are trading way above uh, what a uh, skew and a, a historical distribution might uh, suggest, Mark. Yeah, I don't think this is our last question here on skew as well. I'm sure we'll have a bunch of these. I know this is, again, this has been a, a hot topic of research for you of late of skew the Robin Hood effect, the meme stocks, call it what you will, kind of hard to... <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to ignore it out there these days. All right. Next up, we got our first live one coming in. This comes from Big Mon. Big Mon. <laughs> he wants to know, can you give an example of using stock to hedge Delta? All right. Interesting question. I guess he wants an explanation of Delta neutral type trading. Easy for me to say. Delta neutral type trading. And perhaps if you have an example, have at it. Yeah, but this is a, actually a you know, seemingly simple question, but it, it has a lot of layers. Um, as market makers, we used to have to uh, hedge uh, our deltas, but um, you know, the, this you know, I'll, I'll take the question on its simplest form, and then we'll get into it a little bit more. So, you know, if you have a uh, let's just say a hedge position like a long straddle, you, you there's no stock re requirement. It's a long put of a, with a negative delta, let's just say negative 50, and a call with a positive 50. So if you add those together, there's no excess delta. Now, if the stock moves, then the call, let's say it goes up, the call will have a higher delta and the put will have a lower delta. That net delta might be you know, a net positive 20. So then you would need to sell 20 shares of stock to be delta hedged, so to speak. So now 
what we used to call it is hedge your happiness. If it goes up or if it goes down, you're equally happy. So think about it that way. Now, there are a lot of confounding factors. You know, there's uh, gamma. Uh, so now when we're above the stock, the, the stock, there is more gamma now down towards the strike than, we're, than if it were continuing to go up. Uh, there are also uh, sometimes when you have very small priced options, uh, the uh, tendency to have higher volatilities in those small strike options might create a higher delta. So uh, the rule is if there's a higher volatility and there's an out of the money option, you have more de delta exposure. So sometimes those uh, extraordinarily high implied volatility, small options will command a higher delta in the Black-Scholes formula. However, uh, you would be advised uh, perhaps to look at actuality rather than implied volatility. And, and it may be that the real distribution is less than that, and thus the implied volatility should be less, and thus the delta held should be less. So you, one of the difficult things about delta hedging is actually knowing the right delta. It's not as easy as just plugging in the formula that you'll see on the screen by a long shot. And, um, you know, a lot of training firms, like I used to back traders on the floor. I used to be, have a market making operation on the floor of the SIBO and that we, we would work on simulating, uh, deltas because, you know, volatilities would change the stocks would move. And so there's a lot that goes into that. So, um, that, you know, again, these are awesome questions and we could go on forever, but I want to get to as many as possible. But I, I, I think that covers it for, for uh, stock hedging yeah. with deltas. I wasn't expecting a question on delta neutral. That's why I like our audience. They're always throwing us curveballs out there, delta hedging. Again, as Matt mentioned, this is not something that really is that viable for a lot of the retail out there. It requires a significant amount of capital and margin relief and everything else to do effectively. We were talking about this recently on our options bootcamp show with Dan about gamma scalping, which is kind of another side of doing this. And it's, it's difficult for retail, but it's interesting to, to understand and to know out here. Uh, speaking of uh, retail out here, the next one comes from Chase Bennett. I do believe he was listening to one of our other shows, Matt. He listened to our options bootcamp show. We were talking recently about closing Covered calls, and we mentioned, I believe it was Dan talking about how his system, he likes to close your covered call when the underlying moves through the strike. And we have Chase, he, he couldn't wait till Options Boot Camp, which is tomorrow. He has to ask his question now. He says, uh, hey guys, love the show. On a recent episode about rolling covered calls, uh, you guys mentioned rolling when the underlying goes through the strike price. I will likely have this happen soon, but I still have 50 days or so until expiration. Can I wait a bit? I know you typically wait to answer on the podcast, but my underlying just went through the strike. Oh, it sounds like it moved even as he was writing the question. Can I wait till closer to expiration or should I go ahead and roll? I would really appreciate your thoughts. So a couple of things here, Matt. Maybe first off, we've talked before about your optimal covered call structure. If you want to hear that, listeners, go check out the most recent episode of the Advisor's Option. Maybe a corollary to that. If you have thoughts on when do you like to close slash roll a covered call? Is it when the underlying breaks through the strike or is there some other criteria you use? And then B, to this latter portion of this question, Chase is worried because we were talking about rolling a covered call when it goes through the strike, but he's got a longer term covered call. He says 50 days left to go. Should he be rolling it now or can he sit for a little bit? So it's a uh, it's a difficult question. and it, uh, uh, A lot of it... Um is determined by how you feel about your stock. But, you know, in a lot of our tests, um, even uh, out of the money calls, we, just holding it to expiration has been the optimal strategy. So if you look uh, on our blog, the ORATS blog, and I'm not sure if you guys picked it up, but we, we tested almost every type of uh, exit strategy and and usually it's just holding it to expiration it, it back tests the best so whether that's because you know right now uh chase has you know s s options that are are you know, kind of near the money but the stock has gone up so you know it is it more likely to go down potentially so for whatever reason it it tends to back test best just to to sell your calls generally leave them alone but i would suggest uh, looking at the the study that we did over three million back tests, and you can see uh, some of the uh, some of the things that we found out, Mark. 
So you prefer the set it and forget it approach to covered calls then? No rolling. Yeah, I, I, I like to hold off. Uh, just you know, it's, it's some somewhat counterintuitive, but uh, you know, again, I look at testing rather than what I what I would think intuitively, Mark. Yeah, because I know a lot of our audience they tend to lean towards the more active side of the fence. So when it goes through their strike, they want to roll. And it sounds like maybe. His outlook on this underlying has changed. Maybe let us know some more details, Chase. We can help you out a little bit more. What underlying, why you chose to go as far. That's one of the reasons why I tend not to like the longer term covered calls for reasons like this. You know, you have doesn't give you as much flexibility. Shorter term, you can kind of take it as Matt does, you know, set it and forget it, particularly in the weekly because it's only a week. Unless it's a game or an AMC, it's probably not going to blow up in your face too much. And you can always reset, reanalyze what strikes you want to do and do it again the next week or perhaps even the next month. When you're going out two, three, four months, a quarter, whatever, things get a little bit more and more, shall we say, fluid out there. So, yeah, it's interesting. I encourage you to check out that study. Maybe we'll have to retweet it or put it on the site as well so you can check it out. But uh, the covered call, the covered call analysis. Oh, Matt, you're not done. Sounds like you have more. On the covered call side, sir. Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, um, it, that's exactly right, Mark. What we found was the the longer terms didn't work as well. And so, uh, if my recollection is correct, it was a thirty day, maybe a fifteen delta. So that's pretty far out. And you might think, well, there's not that much, you know, there's not that much premium there. But you know, you, you don't really think about the premium. You think about the premium capture. So you're going to capture a lot of that premium, whereas if you sell something closer, it might be more premium, but you're not, you don't have a high of a probability of capturing it. So uh, that's, those are the things that I would look at, especially in today's environment. If you have stock, there are some uh, options that are so far out of the money, you should be selling stock, you know, even if it's something that you don't normally do. Um, you, you know, I, I've been looking at, at these far out of the monies and, and man, I, if I own stock for sure, I'd be selling something against it. Cause if it, if it went to their, a, you would probably sell it and, and probably not going to go there, Mark. Uh Oh, going into the dark side of selling the wings. Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll get to that. I'm sure you probably have a question about that somewhere here too. But yeah, fascinating stuff. I, as I do recall, Matt, and all your back tests you've done in the past too, when it comes to covered call, it still seems like the lion's share of the outperformance, the bang for your buck comes on the appreciation side. So another reason why probably these smaller Delta type calls, particularly in this environment, do pretty well, Matt. Yeah. And, um, you know, you know. Also, you know, we are testing in a uh, in a bullish environment, so you have to keep that in mind. You know, that's not going to that's not going to continue, or you know, it may not continue. So you just have to keep in mind, you know, the the back testing environment. But yeah, in our tests, you know, now we have a lot of you know from 2017. Now there's been a, a quite a few environments. So uh, it, you know, it's it's really shown you know out of the money, uh, not too long. And um, um, I'm going to pull it up right now because I think it was avoiding earnings um, as well. But uh, I'll, I'll get it up here, Mark. And you know what I'll do as well as I will um, I'll provide that link. And so uh, people could go to it. Perfect. Our audience loves nothing, if not more data to sink their teeth into. While you're looking for that, I will pull up our next one here. Your popular guy here, Matt. Let's go to. Nico. Nico has a more straightforward question. He wants to know, does Matt have a favorite overall option strategy or maybe a few that he uses regularly in his own portfolios? Also, flip side, is there a clunker (laughs) that he prefers to avoid? So Matt, you're sitting there on your own accounts, trading your own dime. What are your go-to? Sounds like you're a bit of a covered call guy, so maybe in there. I know you're liking selling a little bit of wings right now, so maybe a little bit of that. But what are your go-tos right now? What do you typically tend to employ? And then flip side of that, what do you avoid like the plague, sir? So here's a story. This morning, my wife uh, texted me uh, a Twitter post by Christopher Cole, uh, his Artemis, and he went over his strategy where he likes to overlay certain strategies together. And, and I, and my, my wife knew that I was working feverishly on this over this long weekend. So, um, I like to have a strategy that employs different types of, stra- of strategies and they all work together. So l- let me just break that down. The first thing to do is to find a strategy that you really like, that's going to provide you some 
some good uh, amounts of return. So let's just say, you know, uh, it's a, uh, well, I'll, I'll say one of the ones, I'm, my favorites right now is a poor man's covered call in uh, SPX or SPY, where you're actually selling an in the money put, buying an out of the money put. And so that's like selling an out of the money call and, and, and buying it out of, in the money call. I don't know. So take my word for it. So this is, so that's done. That strategy is done well. And by the way, that's also a diagonal. So, uh, you're, you, you are buying longer dated, uh, and selling uh, shorter dated. So that's a good strategy. I mean, that's just a basic kind of long and selling. That's almost like a covered call uh, strategy right there. So now, Obviously, that has problems if the, if the market goes down. So now I, I want puts with that. So I have these puts that normally cost you money, but we have, uh, you know, very, very long term puts that I like. So, um, you know, 555 days, 10 deltas way out there and and some 90, um, 90 day, 15 deltas, something's around um around the, those uh, time frames. And, and Mark, I should also suggest this isn't investment advice. These are just uh, tests and, and some things that I do for, for myself. You know, if I were advising someone and I am a registered investment advisor, I would want to know, you know, about their risk tolerances and all that. So I'm just kind of putting things out there for people to do more studies on and ask their advisors about. So then I have the put. So now I've got a, uh, you know, a long put spread or a long call spread essentially. And then a, uh, and then a uh, few puts uh, on top of that. And then what you'll, and then when you back test that, you'll notice that it, th that actually performs quite well. And the year it doesn't perform well, 2018. 2018 is a tough year. And so what you needed in 2018 was, uh, especially in December when the market corrected, but we really didn't get that big of a pop in implied volatility so the the puts that you had those way out of the money puts usually when the market goes down they, they explode in implied volatility and that's a good hedge but if it's just if the market's kind of just melting down to those puts you're not really going to get the bump that you need and that december was not good for this strategy so uh, on top of the strategy i put you know what really worked well in 2018 was a was a put calendar and again it's a diagonal but so a put cal out of the money put calendar so as the market kind of melts down to that strike that's where you want it to go at a put calendar now i know i'm introducing a lot here but those are the types that's the type of overall strategy that i like mark one that's uh you know th that i could just go to bed and i don't care like if it goes down i i'm going to be fine if it goes up i'm going to be fine and um it, it, you know, I'll, I'll, I will also throw a short put spread on top of that if, if my decay gets too much. Um, and, you know, if the market looks like that, look, looks like it, it would be uh, right for it. So I'll throw some things on it like a UVXY, um, like a long put potentially. Um, I'll throw things on it. Um, uh, what else do I throw on? Uh, like a VIX. Um, well, we're going to talk about VIX a little bit later, but like, you know, um, maybe a long put in, in VIX. So those are, the, those are, I have some ancillary strategies and then I have some strategies that are there all the time. So I don't know if I was clear enough on that, but, but, uh, uh th those are the types of strategies that I like to do more. I like it. You mentioned calendars. We got this one coming in from the live crew right now from Barrelay. Barrelay wants to know, would you rather set up a time spread in a contango or in a backwardation implied vol environment? Well, Barrelay, if you give us any more details, I'm assuming you want your straight up typical one month at the money, buying the one month out, selling the front month. I'm assuming that's what you're going for. If you have something else, I'll let us know. Matt, obviously you're doing that in a nice backward IV environment. You're going to get a lot of juice for that front contract when you're selling it, the flip side, of course, is going to be whipping all over the place. So what are your thoughts here for Barrelay? You're doing your calendars, your time spreads. What do you like, contango or a little bit of juicy backwards IV, sir? Uh, yeah, first, so just so everyone understands what, what uh, Barrelay is asking. So a time spread is, is, yeah, when you're long, the longer term and short, the, the front. And in backwardation, the front is higher. In contango, the front is a lower implied volatility. So you know, intuition might say you'd rather sell it in a backwardation environment because you're getting, you know, like you say, a lot more premium in that front month. However, there's also premium 
you know, what usually happens is both of them go up. <laughs> Backwardation doesn't mean that, that the back didn't go up as well. So that's not always the case, Mark, where you want to do that type of a time spread um, in, in uh, contango or backwardation. As a matter of fact, I, I, I would test it. I didn't see this question come in, so it must have, must have been uh, from a recent question or else I would have thrown it in the back tester. But I would say, I would say contango probably would, would test better. Just because, um, you know, as you say, the, uh, you know, what's going on in the market might drive it away from the strike that you, where you want it to go. Um, and, and kind of a rule of thumb uh, that I, that I uh, tend to uh, think about is the, the market doesn't get the volatility low enough. And they don't get the volatility high enough. And what that means is, when when there's not that much volatility, they don't get it low enough. They won't take it down past a certain amount. That's usually a contango, contango type place. And then um, when it gets really high, they don't get it high enough. So, uh, you know, I think both of those play into selling those uh, in a contango. Uh, and I mean, in doing a time trade in a contango would probably be without testing it. Um, the the guess I would make, Mark. Yeah, you're right, because you, your intuition would say backwardation. You're getting all that juice, right? But you're whipping all over the place, too. And uh, Contango is certainly probably more predictable, more reliable over time. <laughs> backwardation, kind of probably more of a bit of a crapshoot. Interesting. There you go. See, listeners, you're inspiring interesting back tests as we speak. Since we're talking the live, let's go back out to the live. My boy Luigi's got another question out there. So, yeah, if you guys listen in live and you're pro members, you get to jump to the front of the line of all this cool stuff. You get to bump everybody else who sent in other questions uh, to, down the list a little bit. Uh, let's see here. My boy Luigi wants to know, he's going back to skew again, Matt. He says, while looking at the skew, if the implied vol is higher, should you build a position around that side? So he's talking about when the side is bid. So it sounds like I mean, a traditional equity, he'd be talking about building positions around the put side, Matt. What do you have to say to that? Building your position around the the side of the skew where the implied vol is higher. I mean, logically, that that is the case, right? Because you want to profit from that skew coming back down, and so you you would do a you know like if, if the skew, uh, the put skew or the low strike skew is much higher, you know, you might do you know, put, a put spread and you might do a call spread if the other side's higher. So yeah, I, I would look at the the side where uh, where we thought the implied volatility is higher and and have your strikes around there, Mark. Go where the juice is, Mr. Luigi, as opposed to where the juice has already been squeezed out. All right, uh, next up, got another more uh, kind of 10,000-foot questions. Comes from Al's with two A's. They want to know, what's the most back-tested strat at ORAT? So, Mr. Matt, you guys are the keeper of the back-tester machine. People are banging away at it all the time. What is the hot thing? What are folks testing away and banging away at right now over there on the magical back test machine? I'm very happy to answer this question because we don't look. <laughs> so uh, as opposed to every other app out there, it seems like, that tracks your every move and ever, knows everything about everyone, we don't look at, at, at ORATs. We don't uh, monitor that. We want uh, complete an anonymity with our uh, with our back test people, you know, we're not looking at the good ones that people do. We, we, we don't do, look at any of that. So when you're back testing at ORATS, you can feel confident that, that we're not looking at it. Uh, we've, we've had only one client that wouldn't uh, back test with us because they were so worried about their great strategy. They didn't want us looking at it. And, and I said, listen, I've been in business since 2001. I have to keep everything under wraps. I've never had a problem with it. And they still wouldn't do it. Um, it's a very famous fund, by the way. But uh, we don't look. I'd like to know. I know the ones that uh, the ones that I'm talking about are, are the ones that uh, I get asked the most about, um, and the ones that I, I I work on the most. But we don't look, Mark. Interesting. The anonymity. So you can't even do like some sort of anonymized, just kind of aggregate data, like hey, X percent are doing covered calls, and kind of group them into buckets. Nothing even like that. No, we don't do that. Um, again, we want to keep it uh, as anonymous as possible. I got gotcha. you. People out there they, in the on the pro side, they appreciate their anonymity, even though it would be fun to to crunch that data a little bit there. All right. Uh, next up, another one back from the live chat. Big Mon. Big Mon. He wants to know, has Matt ever back tested the Iron Fly? Well, you didn't give us much criteria to go on there. Big Amon, do you have a particular underlying or a particular way you like to structure your Iron Fly, a certain percent out of the money with the wings, anything like that? But that said, Matt, 
general iron flies. Is this a strategy you like? And have you ever run any back tests on these? Well, I'm going to guess it's a uh, Kurt Duplessis over at Option Alpha type iron fly, our friend. <laughs> Does he like iron uh, flies too? And, and he, uh, he does a lot of these. And so uh, it's usually ETFs. We have, um, they test okay. Um, but, uh, you know, with the iron fly, um, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, like, like I said, it, 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 it tests, you know, decently. Uh, but, you know, you're, you're, the reason that you're doing an iron fly in a lot of cases is, you know, you need to protect your, uh, your wings. And it, it just depends on how, uh, you know, how well you could buy those wings is that actually derives a lot of the strategy and and often in the underlyings that people are using the the wings are actually pretty wide and, and, and difficult to buy so a lot of that has to come comes down to execution and knowing when to buy the wings it's not necessarily the iv but w- that's what most people key on but it's getting a good fill getting a good wing because that really eats and you know like i said before the premium that you're getting is not uh, even though you're getting a lot of premium, it's that the probability of keeping that premium is what you're really concerned about. And you can't just give away a, a, a small put just because you think that it's not taking that much away from the entire strategy, because that that is often the, the, the profit. Um, your profit amount is that wing. So you have to be really careful about the wing. So um, what what uh, what we do uh, in our testing is we will set pretty tight constraints on. And, and you can you could set how wide you want the, each leg and, and the, the overall. And so th- that's what comes uh, and, and that's what's you know very important in these are, are the wings. So you know what, often when I trade, I'll, I'll try to buy the wing first. I know I could get some premium and they have the money, but uh, getting a wing when it's you know it might be 15 cents at 40 cents, you know you don't want to play, pay the mid market there. you're giving up an awful lot of money. So hopefully that makes sense more. Go for the wings first when uh, slinging an iron fly. Interesting. I used to have a, a cohort, a compatriot on our Volatility Views program, who, who, because I've always been a fan of iron flies, and the iron condor has always got so much more love, and it always mystified me. And he used to joke that an iron condor was the iron butterfly for cowards, Matt. What do you, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> I like that saying. It's the same thing. The, uh, the iron fly, uh, again, most people don't pay enough attention to how much they're paying for those, those wings. And, um, you know, I, I uh, in my trading, I, I test each uh, you know, group, grouping separately. And often, um, you know, I think it's better to do uh, two diagonals rather than a why, why do you want to, you know, have a fixed iron fly? I mean, it's easier to understand, but a lot of times that, that isn't the best uh, strategy to put on. So, you know, if you're really looking at it, you would, you would, you would consider at least a, a diagonal selling, you know, selling a diagonal out there. And also you would look at, uh, you know, having different deltas that you're using for the call side and the put side for the diagonal. And, um, you know, uh, different deltas, different days to expiration, all that stuff. So, uh, I don't, I don't like how uh, constraining uh, both iron flies and um, iron condors are. I like to look at, I like to look at it um, on its face. And w- you know, we do a, a complete forecast of every single option and, and each surface, and we could put that into our our scanner. Um, and so I could see which which uh, options I think are under and overvalued. So I have a I have a lot more of a pick uh, between those, and that's the, I think that's the important way to, to to look at it, Mark. Interesting. Not a fan of either. You prefer the diagonals. We can get into that more. But we got more people hitting us up. Next up, we've got uh, Matt. Matt Thomas wants to know another Matt. Matt to Matt here. He says I've got some nice gains in Spy, Amazon, and Tesla right now. Well, you're probably not alone out there, Matt. A lot of people have had decent runs in the broad market and in some of these names you mentioned over the past year or so. He wants to know the the perennial question, Matt, what is the best way to protect them? He's got a two-parter. Over the summer and then for the rest of the year, I have to imagine a lot of people are coming to you at ORATS right now, Matt, with some variation on this exact same question. I'm sitting on X gains in this underlying 
what the heck should I do? So he gives us some specifics. He says spy. So we're talking broad market as well as some more kind of high flying tech names. Uh, what are your thoughts on the effective ways to hedge these in the near term and longer term, sir? Again, this is an investment advice. There's some tax reasons and such that you'll have to look at. You, you can't look like you're selling uh, the stock using options. But um, I, I have to tell a story. It happened around, uh, you know, 1999, 2000, around the dot-com boom. And uh, a guy came to me and said, hey, I have all this eToys uh, stock. And eToys is trading about 80, 85, I believe. And so I go, well, you're going to want to put a, uh, you're going to want to put a collar on and, you know, sell a call and that more than paid for the put. And, you know, if that stock did, wasn't trading $4 <laughs> three, three weeks later, um, and he just, uh, you know, it just totally protected him. So, uh, did he give callers, you a big hug and a kiss, sir, after that? Actually, no, you, you know, the, the most thankless thing ever is a investment advisor. <laughs> uh, You're right. They just, they, you know, they'll get you if, you know, if, if, if you miss it, they'll, they'll, they'll give you a hard time, but, uh, there's not a lot of things. So you just, you know, you have to be just, uh, you know, confident in what you're doing. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, a, a caller is the easiest. And, and again, they, they don't need to match up, meaning you don't have to sell uh, the call and buy the put in the same in the same month. So, I, I, again, I would look at, you know, you know, look at your um, look at your outlook. Uh, look at how much what your gains are and, and do some type of a collar. Uh, you know, people do put spread collars because puts are expensive sometimes. But now with the calls, especially in the ones that he's talking about, uh, spy, you, might, you know, you might consider a put spreads collar. But Amazon and Tesla, they they have pretty good skews to them. So you could, you could sell some calls at some pretty good prices there and still out, out of the money enough. So you're not really going to give away too much and you could get a put. And, uh, um, you know, I, I, don't, I wouldn't get too fancy like with a, you know, like a, a put back spread or something like that. But, you know, I, I, I would just, uh, you know, put to your friend, uh, get some puts, different expirations, uh, you know, multiple years uh, down to 90 days. I, I wouldn't go less than 90 days. So hopefully that helps. Collars, a big fan of collars. And, and I'm sure you've probably seen this data as well, Matt. You know, one of the most far reaching studies I've ever seen on the collar was back a few years back now. It's, I like to see an update to it because it's been, probably four or five years since they've really run the research, but the folks over at OIC did a great collar study. They started it with collaring the Qs, and then they expanded it to other equities, and they expanded it to other asset classes. You can look at gold or ags, or you name it. They really explored how to use collars on a number of different underlyings, and then also they played with it. Like you mentioned, Matt, they played with the collar. That's one of the cool things about the collar. That's what drives me crazy. People come in, they're always, oh, I want this zero cost, keep everything in the same month. And that's usually the least effective way to do a collar. You push that put out a little bit, and I think the OIC data centered around somewhere around that six-month time frame was a bit of the sweet spot. And then you push that call side up. They, I think when they were running this data, the weekly still weren't as big of a player. So they, they ended, I think, around the monthlies. But I'd be interested to see an update of this with the weeklies as well. I'd imagine that would probably change the game a little bit. But if you play with those calls and those puts a little bit, there's a lot you can do with a collar. And at the end of the day, if it works out well, it probably won't cost you that much. And a lot of great data on how they outperform. Date, Matt, have you seen this data from the OIC folks? It, it's a little bit dated now, but it's still, to my knowledge, the most exhaustive analysis of collars I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could remember that guy. I, I like this guy who did it. Um, if someone in Mixler knows, uh, his name escapes me right now, but I was there for, for the presentation and saw the, and I think I have the paper, uh, and they did, they did a nice job on it. Uh, again, um, you know, what I like to suggest is test the put separately from the calls. Like, for example, you want to, I think you want to sell a shorter term, more out of the money call by uh, out of very far out of the money, um, longer term put. Um, and you could even do, you could even uh, buy more puts because they're, they're, they're less expensive. So that, that's, th those are the, the, that's the way I like to do it, Mark, not, not testing it as a caller. You could then bring it back in our back tester and combine it and see how, how it looks. But that's how I like to, to at least start out, look, look for the best call on its own. And then look for the best put on its own and, and do it that way. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I know Phil Gaki commissioned the research. I forgot the name of the researchers who actually 
conducted it over there. It could be Black and Cesaro. They did a lot of stuff for OIC uh, back in the day. But I'll have to go look. I know they had it. I think it was Black, yeah. Yeah, okay. It probably was them. That Black and Black and Cesaro did a lot of their their stuff. And we, we've linked to this study in the past. Maybe we'll link to it again. It's still the most comprehensive look I've seen at collars across a broad array of asset classes. So if you're in the same category as, uh, I forgot the name of the listener here. What was it? Matt, who wanted, who's sitting on some gains. You're looking at ways to hedge them. You know, you don't have to go crazy. You know, keep it simple. Stupid does work. A collar, it can be as complex as you make it, but you probably want to play with it a little bit to make it a little bit more effective. And there's a lot of great data there on how to do it. Or hit up Matt for a more specific analysis with his magical backtest machine. All right, Matt, I knew we'd probably, actually, before we get to that, actually, we're kind of getting, we're kind of getting meme now. Here comes some of the meme related questions. This is a, a number two here from Nico. Yeah, because he just asked a question a little while ago. Nico coming in again. Uh, he wants to know, does ORATS offer any sort of small Delta call scanner so we can track down your, quote, Robin Hood effect for ourselves? Matt, this is kind of something you've been chronicling for a while. You mentioned at the top of the show what you term the Robin Hood effect, the the bid of all these, you know, retail Robin Hood, whatever you want to call them, accounts piling into the upside typically in these names. Nico wants to know, are, are you doing any sort of scanning for people to try to find this stuff? Yeah, so um, I'm going to combine maybe a couple of the, of, of the questions. As I mentioned on, a, on the advisor's option, I saw this back test that someone else did, and it was on these very small calls. And I noticed that they used a complete, they used almost a VIX calculation to determine fair value. We have a forecast of volatility that looks at you know historical volatility, earnings, skew, all this stuff, right? And so we 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 uh, forecast the entire volatility service for every option. And I noticed that we were in agreement. So I thought that was neat. Uh, you know, he used a pretty exhaustive uh, method for, for calculating what he thought the upcoming volatility or, or fair, fair vol would be for a lot of these stocks. And what he was finding is he's like some of them have like zero theoretical value and uh, just, you know, our, our bid in, in the market. And, um, you know, we do something like that. So we, we, we start building with a forecast, but then we, we use the skew in the market in order to skew it up. I don't know if that makes any sense because if you're looking at just volatility, you're never going to get the calls as high as you need them. So we, we have methods to, to, uh, put our forecasts and, and then bid them up in the very far out of the money. So, um, you know, I'm talking zero Delta one Delta, something like that. So yes, the answer is yes, we have scanners. I use them. Um, and what, what the way I, the way I do it is, you know, I, I do like, I don't think it's like five to 40 days and like between, um, one half of one Delta. So 0.005 and one Delta. So we're really far out of the money. And then I could sort on our forecast. And so I'm often finding 99%, 95% of, you know, of value. So it might be, you know, it might be a, uh, worth a penny and it's uh, trading a dollar something out there so that's how I will find those so I so I would use that type of of a scan in order and then I could paste in you know a couple hundred of of the stocks that I could go in in, in our data API and find stocks that aren't as crazy as maybe the meme stocks or whatever and so now you know like Adobe is coming out um, FedEx, uh, but Boeing is, you know, there, there are some uh, really high uh, wings in those types of stocks that I'm, I'm comfortable selling a couple of, uh, of those. And then, um, you know, as you collect and, and then, uh, you know, I, I put in a bid immediately at 50% profit. And then, so I'm just trying to get, you know, as we say, pick up uh, pennies in front of a steamroller, but I think the steamroller is pretty far away and I'm, and I, and I, I could see it pretty well, I hope. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, yes, we have a, a, a scanner that I think works quite well. And, um, yeah, you could, you could go ahead and set it up the way we set it up is we set up a back test and you could set up, you know, that Delta range and you could set up, uh, you know, stocks that you could filter out and have a certain amount of volatilities and, and such. So I, I, um, I'm able to uh, define the stocks, define the options, and then sort on our forecast value. And I, I've been finding some pretty, pretty good options, Mark. 
Well, speaking along those lines uh, of trading the meme names, we got some related questions here, Matt. Uh, there, we'll, we'll lump them together. You kind of touched on a little bit of this, but uh, the first one comes from MMT. He says, what's the best way to trade meme stocks using options? I know buying calls can work out, but that's usually very, very expensive. My approach has been approximately 5% to 10% to 15 to 20%. Out of the money butterfly. So I'm assuming he means buying the leg 5% out, selling the leg 10% out, and then buying the second leg 15 to 20% out of the money somewhere in that range. So, Matt, what are your thoughts on using call flies or perhaps put flies in the meme names? And then a related question here from Victoria. She wants to know about everybody's favorite these days, AMC. AMC is currently trading at approximately 300% volatility for at the money options in June. How would you recommend trading that using options or should I just steer clear? So, Matt, I knew we would get Mimi eventually. Here we go, sir. What are your thoughts here on everyone's favorites these days, AMC game and related names and how, if possible, I know you like selling the crazy wings, but how, if possible, do you like to approach these, sir? Yeah, so uh, here's how I would approach it. First of all, the butterflies, usually not the best way to go on these because the butterfly, you know, is, is I think more for something that uh, y- y- where you could leg in or get a butterfly very cheaply and then have uh, have the stock kind of drift towards that central strike and then you, you, you do well. Uh, these meme stocks are such high volatility that those, you're, you're, it's hard to find good butterflies. So I, I, the, the butterflies aren't really the way that I like to look at it. The way I like to, to trade, as you know, Mark, is to, uh, you know, find some pretty, cra- there, there's some pretty crazy pricing out there. Now you, you have to, you have to do it very small and, and, um, but there, there are ways to do it. For example, right now there's a, uh, with AMC is trading 31, uh, the 60, 73, uh, vertical is trading 86 cents. So you could sell. Uh, you know, 60, 73. And, I love it. Yeah. So here's what's going to happen, right? So you sell that for 86 cents. It has to double. By the time it's doubling, the 73 calls are going up too. So you could get out. So that seems like a, uh, you know, uh, you know, that's what's coming up on, on our, uh, ORAT scanner, uh, it's got a 15% edge in our forecasts. We also do edge in our uh, distribution, 6% edge. So that's those those are the types of, of trades that, that I would look at. Um, you know, I, that's so there's there's edge in the call. Let's see, the best put spread coming up right now is a 26-21. Uh, I, I wouldn't like that, but it's 274. So you're selling a five dollar put spread that's uh five dollars out of the money uh for 274 so you, you know you're getting a fair amount of money for it so uh that's the that's in june uh, or early or, uh, that's a month away so or, i'm sorry july those are that's uh july in a month so those are those are the types that are coming up on the scan um you know there's not a huge amount of risk in that one. I mean, your, your risk is, uh, you know, only, what is it? $2 and something. So, uh, you know, to make 274. So those are, that's what I would look at, Mark. Yeah, you're right. These are challenging and you're right. Butterflies are, are not ideal. Every once in a while, I'll, I'll try a flyer out there, Matt, on some of these, like put on a crazy bid for like a you know nickel and a dime and some of these crazy names. I got filled on one this morning in AMC uh, for a dime, and it was a pretty decent fly, but you're right. It, the, these things are whipping around so much that the chances of these things coming in right at your max strike are, are pretty much like, like throwing a dart, which is why I, I don't spend a ton on these. But I do like that notion of the of the far, far upside vertical. And you're right, going back to that question we had earlier about Delta Neutral, if it does start to come to pass or those strikes are suddenly coming into contention. You could also, you have a lot of room there between where it's trading now 30 and what'd you say the 60 strike to pick up a little stock if you wanted to, to actually hedge that if you are worried about the worst coming to pass. So if it did break into the highs, but I think we got a ways to go before there, but interesting stuff as well. Speaking of names, people like to trade Matt and have questions about these days outside of all things. Mimi people like volatility as well, in particular VIX, this next one comes from JTAO here, and we're kind of coming up against it. So let's see. This may be our last one here. We'll see. JTAO says, I've been looking at VIX calls for a while to spec on a market downturn. 
Do you have an optimal approach when trading VIX calls? Uh, simply long out of the money calls, but he puts in parentheses that gets pricey pretty quickly. Uh, should I look at call verticals or butterflies? But he puts in parentheses that limits your ability to capture upside or perhaps something different like ratio one by two call spreads where you're short one and long two. Matt, this is kind of like the perennial question in VIX land as well as like, you know, how do you how do you keep your table stakes? How do you keep your seat at the table until you can capture that big explosive upside like we saw last March that we know VIX is capable of doing, but it gets expensive over time to maintain that. So what, what is your go to if you have one, Matt, for folks who are looking at specking at a little bit of upside right now in VIX? Yeah. And again, this is not investment advice, um, but yeah, I have some absolute favorites. And, um, you know, if you want to hit me up, Matt at orats.com. I love this strategy. Uh, it's a, it's a call back spread. Uh, so short one, long two, uh, you do it for a pretty good credit, uh, you know, at least a half a percent. Um, and you, uh, so you have units, you're getting paid, uh, and it, it, it performs pretty well. So that's the, you know, so I like that one and I like, um, longer term way out of the money, uh, VIX calls just to have those on. Um, and you know, just, you'll get paid maybe three times over the next 10 years <laughs> and you, you know, unfortunately, and you have to do it small, but you should just have some, you know, again, try to get filled as well as you can. But just, you know, just ha- have some, you know, little, you know, I always have puts on, I always have little VIX calls on. Um, I like this, you know, the, that's not re- a real strategy, meaning um, it's it's uh, just something to, to keep in your back pocket. A real strategy is just kind of, it takes a little bit more work, this one by two call back spread, uh, way far out of the money, but also, but you can still get some decent premium out of it and you still have units. Uh, what you always want to have in VIX is units. Um, you'll get paid, you know, a decent amount um, in, in the big in the big times, and you'll make um, you'll make some selling calls, you know, selling pre- call premium. Uh, so I, I, that's a strategy I really like, Mark. Yeah, it's hard to argue against that one. That was the go-to for a long time in VIX land. It requires a certain you know degrees of, of setups up there in the market to really be optimal you know the selling one and buying two but you're right that does get you the long units it gets you to keep your seat at the table and allows you to capture those moments like let's say march without spending an exorbitant amount of money without going out and gobbling up a bunch of calls that definitely longer term is one of the ones i like to look at as well unfortunately mr matt that music means we've come to the end of our inaugural options pro q and a session i want to thank all of you out there who joined us for this this week. It was really fun. You guys hit us up left, right, and center. Remember, going forward, these are going to be for our pro members. We're going to have a lot of great guests rotating in. So if you enjoyed this, you want to get another crack at the old apple here and join us on the program with your questions about a broad variety of things. Maybe you have a guest you want to feature on the show so you can pick their brain. Join up, hit us up, let us know. We're pretty accommodating with that kind of stuff, as you can see from the wide range of questions (laughs) we took in today. But Mr. Matt, I want to thank you for patiently and ably taking on all comers here. You set the tone for all others to follow now in our Q&A sessions. But if folks are intrigued They want to kick the tires for themselves on all the various things you talked about today, sir. The back tester, the earnings data, all this other cool stuff you have cooking. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Well, Mark, first, I'd like to say that you you are doing a great job. These questions are amazing. These uh, your listeners are um, are off the charts. So, I mean, you should uh, you should take a bow. And and when you get back up, uh, you could. Go, go on over to orats.com. Hit me up at Matt at Orats. We have uh, consulting services. If you have, uh, you know, if you want to see some of these uh, tests, like I said, we're we're registered, so we could talk uh, turkey on, on a lot of the stuff. Uh, we have some awesome optimizers and back testing and simulators and machine learning, and so like we, you know, it's just it's it's uh, the reason I started Orats was to get what hedge funds and only the, the largest f- funds and, and pension funds could could have to, you know, to regular folks. So, you know, come on over to ORATS. There's a lot of, of uh, just uh, 
great stuff there. We've been working on it since, like I said, 2001. So there's, uh, uh, you know, amazing tools, uh, a lot of data. Um, and, um, you know, we could get you set up in, in some strategies, at least, uh, you know, back testing can save you a, a lot of money on, uh, going down the wrong, wrong path. And um, there's also some, some really nice strategies out there, Mark. So uh, appreciate being the first one on the, on this, uh, on the show, if, if this is any indication, uh, uh, it's going to be a very successful show. So thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for joining us, Matt. And you did set a high bar for all of our future guests to follow. So we'll look forward to seeing if they're up to the challenge. And I agree, our audience is clearly up to the challenge. Great questions, everyone out there, left, right, and center, all sorts of fun questions. We didn't even get to all of them here. So keep hitting at us. Keep sending those questions. And if you like what you hear, again, head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash shop that'll teach you and show you all the information of all the different things we have cooking over there as well as what you can expect this a lot more when you join us for these fun sessions again more coming these are going to be probably every tuesday and then oddities on every friday to start and then a lot more to come down the road of course there's more coming tomorrow you got options boot camp options playbook radio hitting the network as usual tomorrow and then thursday Back again for episode two of the Option Block. That was off for Monday, so that's our first dose of that for this week, as well as TWIFO Friday Volatility Views. It all kicks off again next week with another fun array of programming, and then next Tuesday with another fun pro Q&A session. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>